all know, the Bible has been one of the most influential books in the history of the world. And certainly in, in Western culture, uh, the Bible is one of those things that, uh, whether we know it or not, uh, permeates a lot of the things uh, that we see and do. Whether it's the influence it's had on, on film, you know, like The Chosen that Adam was talking about, or in, in plays or in quotes that we make. Uh, or in just a variety of other different ways within our culture, the Bible is prevalent. And here's just a few examples of it. Uh, you know, we talk about liberty and freedom in our country, and this isn't meant to be a political thing, but our Liberty Bell has the words of Leviticus written on it. Those of my, and my friends here from Detroit, or have a, a little bit of a knowledge of uh, Things going in Detroit, like this is one of the the main icons uh, there in downtown Detroit. It's called the Spirit of Detroit. But right behind it, I don't know if you can see it uh, in the picture, but right behind it has scripture from Second Corinthians three seventeen. Now I kind of like the picture of it this way because I'm excited about baseball season starting. But they like to they like to decorate our statue in Detroit. Go figure. I'm from there, if you didn't know. So. Um, and then there are other things that we have seen in our culture that where the Bible is prevalent. And sometimes it's for the good, and sometimes it's not so good. So George Washington started the tradition of being sworn into office with his hand on a Bible. Martin Luther King, in his I Have a Dream speech, um, in the section where he says that we will not be satisfied... He quotes directly from Amos chapter 5 where he says, We will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. That comes from Amos 5. Even here in the city of Xenia, in front of our courthouse, we have uh, the Ten Commandments there. And then, sadly, last month our own president awkwardly used the Bible as a prop uh, for a photo op in the midst of the demonstrations that were happening. Yet, the Bible is used and it's prevalent. And we see it in lots of different ways throughout it. But the Bible is more than just a cultural prop or just even a cultural influence. The Bible is meant to be something more. And so if you have your notes, go ahead and pull them out. And I have some blanks that you can fill in for, for you as you follow along. But I'm going to go over just four things that I want us to remember, four things that I want to challenge us on, that when we think about the Bible, what is really the importance of it, and how should we allow that uh, to influence us in our Christian life? So, so the first one is, what is the goal? The goal of really getting to know your Bible. So, the reason we wanted to spend five sermons on this topic is because it is our prayer for all of us that we hold the Bible in the highest, the highest importance in our life. Now, I don't think all four of our, the elders here at EBC would word it this way. So this is the way that I would word it. Um, but I would say that a goal is for the Bible to be the theme song of your life. And I kind of think of it this way. Again, now the baseball season has started, and I'm pretty excited about that. Um, we want the Bible, to, in a sense, to be your walk-up music. Like, you know, when, when batters come to the plate or when a relief pitcher comes in from the bullpen, uh, you know, the sound guy usually plays a specific song related to that person. And sometimes they pick a song, it's just because it's cool, and you know, that, that particular player likes that song. Other times they pick a song because that song epitomizes the type of player that that is. Um, but that song is something that then defines, in some ways, the... The, the type of player that it is. So whether they're an energetic person or, or you know, you can tell if they're kind of a, a thrash metal kind of guy or, or if there's, there's something. When I played baseball, I always wanted to have the song called Destiny, which by the group Petra off of uh, 
I don't know, a long time ago. But uh, there was a song that I thought, if I ever made it to the big leagues, this is the song I want to have played. Um, but in just like the B-I-B-L-E song where it says, I stand alone on the word of God. Like, that is what we want for all of us when we think of the Bible. That that is what epitomizes us. That's what defines us. That's the thing that people associate with us is that we are men and woman, women of this book. You know, Psalm 40, verse 3 says, that He put a new song into my mouth, a song of praise to our God, and many will see and put their trust in the Lord. So what is the theme song of your life? When you're feeling down or you're losing hope about something, what comes to your mind? What comforts you? Is it the words of Scripture? When you're confused and you don't know what to do, where do you turn? Do you turn to God's Word? When you're tempted to sin, can you recall the words of Scripture to help you overcome that sin? And when you're awed and amazed by the wonder and beauty of God's creation, does the Bible help you worship God? So what is the theme song of your life? What is the thing that defines you? What epitomizes you? Now, of course, you know, sort of that Sunday school answer is Jesus. And, and, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But it's the words of Scripture that teaches us about Jesus. And it's the words of Scripture that points us in the right direction. It's the words of Scripture that lets us know about God. And if he's going to be first and foremost in our life, we need to know this book. So the first thing I want us to, to remember is that the goal is, and again in my words, that God's word would be the theme song of your life. The second thing, well, oh, I forgot about this. Yeah, the, I love this quote here by John Wycliffe. Um, you know, he's a person who completed the very first English translation of the Bible back in the 1300s. And he says here, all Christian life is to be measured by the scripture, by every word thereof. And of course, what he's saying here is that our standard that we are to measure our life against is God's word. But at the same time, I think he's also kind of getting at the point that when, we are, when people are looking at us, will they see God's word coming out of us? Will that be what defines us? Is that we are men and women of this book. All right, so the second thing. So we have the goal. The second thing is the value. And I want to put it this way, is that it is a privilege to hear from the Lord. You know, we've heard it said that the Bible is God's love letter to us. Um, and the reality is, God could have left us alone to figure this out. You know, as it says in Romans 1, that that we can look around us and we see the beauty of creation and, and, and we're without excuse because of what we see around us. That, that creation itself testifies to God. And so he could have just left us with creation only. But he didn't. He actually wrote something to us, for us, so that we can know him. And to help us live out this Christian life. I like how the psalmist put it here in, the, in these verses here. You know, Adam talked about reading Psalm 119. He says, how sweet are your words to my taste. Sweeter than honey to my mouth. When we read God's word, is it sweet to us? I mean, do, we, do we look forward to it like we look forward to a big bowl of ice cream? 
Your instructions are more valuable to me than millions in gold and silver. Now, I wonder how many of us would say that, or how many of us would say, you know, I'd be willing to trade the Bible if I had a couple million dollars in the bank. I mean, there are times when money is tight, but would you give up God's word in order to have riches? And it is a privilege for us to hear from the Lord, but it's also a privilege, especially for us here in this culture, as Americans, we have God's word in such a way that we often take it for granted. I mean, for most of us, we have our Bible on our phones. How many of us, how many of you have at least one app on your phone that has the Bible on it? Many of us have multiple copies of the Bible sitting on our bookshelves. How many? Let me see hands. How many have more than one Bible? Oh, and more than one Bible. I counted the other day. I have 28 different Bibles. Now, most of those are in languages that I can't read because all the countries that I go to, I, I try and collect the Bible from that local language. But still, we have access to the Bible in such a... How many of us have access to a computer? I think most of us have. The Bible is easily accessible, and it is a privilege for us, yet we take it for granted. And think about these. Think about the stats that are on this page. One in five people are still waiting for the Bible in their own language. Now, I didn't realize that there are over 7,300 languages in this world, but one in five, 20% of the people in the world do not have the Bible in their own language. Now, they might have access to a Bible, but they don't have it in one that they can read in their heart language and understand. There are only 600, and this is as of, uh, I think, October of last year, but there are only 698 Bible, uh, languages that have the full copy of the Bible. As you can see from those other numbers there, that lots of languages have partial copy or in their language, either the Old Test or just the New Testament or other parts, but only less than 700 languages out of 7,300 have the full Bible. What a privilege it is for us to have that. In places I work in Africa, like there are people groups in Ghana and Zimbabwe and Kenya and Egypt that I've been to where they only have portions of one gospel. Yet we are so rich with having accessibility to God's word. And for us to, to hear from him on a daily basis is a privilege that we should not overlook and take for granted. All right. So... We have the goal, we have the value, and the third thing I want us to remember or to think about is the promise, the promises that are in God's word. God's word is transformative. Now, we don't worship the Bible. We hold it with the highest esteem. We hold it with great regard and reverence, but we do not worship this book this book points us to the God to whom we are supposed to be worshiping. But the God who has written this love letter to us has done so not just so that we can have more information about him or so that we can feel good or feel bad about ourselves or so that we can use it in such a way that inspires us as a nation or whatever. The God who has written this love letter to us has written it to us so that it can expose sin to us. He's written it so that he can point to salvation in Jesus Christ. He's written it because it tells us how we, who as we sang just a few minutes ago, how we who were once enemies of God can live a life that is at peace with him, and that is honoring to him. 
God's word changes us. If we read it and we allow the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts in such a way that those words penetrate, we will be changed. It's not easy to walk away from the Bible. Yeah. Sometimes it is easy to walk away from the Bible if we are just really flippant about how we approach it. But if we sit down and we are trusting that this is God's word speaking to us through his spirit, we will walk away from that change. There will be something that we will read that will expose things in our life that we need to work on. There are things that we will walk away from saying, I didn't know this about God, and that is an awesome thing, the way God is. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says that Scripture, it's inspired by God, it's breathed out by God, but Scripture itself is profitable for teaching us, for rebuking us, for correcting us, and the training that we need in righteousness. That's what Scripture can do. It's not just a book to give us information. You know, if you want to know how to stay on the path to purity, God's Word says, live according to the words that God has. Do what God says And you'll have a pure life. God's word guides us like a flashlight in the dark. As Psalm 119 says, Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, says that, We shouldn't be conformed to the world's way of thinking and behaving, but that we should be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Well, how do our minds get renewed? Well, we fill it with God's word. We fill it with God's truth. And unfortunately, too many of us are spending more time allowing our minds to be transformed by all the static that we see on Facebook or all the noise that's being said on any other kind of social media or the news or anything else, and we're allowing those things to be what transform us and our way of thinking rather than what does God's word tell us how we should be thinking and acting and responding to the situations of things going on in this world. And this is God's promises to us is that we can be transformed. Now, I love this quote, and it's often attributed to D.L. Moody, but it actually can be traced 200 years earlier because it was found in the Bible of John Bunyan, um, who is the author of Pilgrim's Progress. But it is so true. It says, either this book will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from this book. And that's the transformative part of God's word, is that if we allow God to speak to us, it will keep us from sinning. Now, it doesn't mean we're not going to be put in situations where we won't be tempted, and it doesn't mean that we won't sometimes make the wrong choice. Because we're all still sinful human beings and we mess up. But God's word is what will help us in those situations. Um, Another favorite quote of mine is from G.K. Chesterton, and I don't have a slide for it, but he has this poignant observation that the Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. And I think how that kind of gets to the transformative part of God's word is when we look at God's word and we say, what does God, what does the Bible need to say to me 
so that I can live a life that is honoring to God? I think often we read it and we say, mm, yeah, that's a little too hard and I'm just not going to do it. I'm going to do my own thing and see how that works out. And then if I have to come back to God's word, I will. But, but we often look at the things that God tells us to do, asks us to do, commands us to do. And we say, no, that's too difficult, so I'm not going to try that. And that's where I think some of our biggest problems come into play when we dismiss God's word and its ability to transform our hearts. Okay, so the last one. Our responsibility. So we have the goal, we have the value, we have the promise, and we have our responsibility. So the fourth thing that we need to take away from this is that there is a role somewhat for us to play in this when it comes to how God's word affects our life, the role of it in, our, in the life of a believer. Now, right here, the verse James 1.22 says, don't just listen to God's word, you must do what it says. So there's, there's several things in there. And so, the first one is that we need to feed on God's word. It's part of the listening element of it. And I would say if we're feeding on God's word, there are three, three pieces to it. That's, that's reading it, that's studying it, and that's memorizing it. God gave us his word, not to be our textbook per se, but to be our food. And though the metaphor of God's word as spiritual food is used throughout Scripture in a variety of different ways, like 1 Peter 2.2 that says, like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that you may grow up in your salvation. Or Hebrews 5.12 where it says that I should be giving you meaty stuff, solid food, but instead you just need milk right now. Or 1 Corinthians 3.2, that, that metaphor is all throughout scripture. But Jesus said that I am the bread of life. That he, and we understand who he is, we know who he is through this book, gives us life. God's word is full of life, having been breathed out by God himself. His words give life. And again, I would say, sadly, many of us are starving. Because we don't open up God's word on a regular basis. And we think we can get by with crumbs here and there rather than really taking seriously this idea that his word is what gives us nourishment for our life. And so whether we end up empty and unsatisfied after we read or study the Bible depends on whether we come to the Bible as life-giving, nourishing food or not. You know, if we just view, simply view the Bible as this book where we can accumu accumulate some knowledge about spiritual things, we're not going to get to the Spirit and the life that is found in the word of God. And we won't receive nourishment from God's word. You know, Charles Spurgeon had this quote, and it says, the Bible study itself, so getting into God's word, studying it, Bible study is the metal that makes a Christian. This is the strong meat on which holy men are nourished. This is that which makes the bone and sinew of men who keep God's words, that keep God's, who keep God's way in defiance of every adversary. Let me reread re that last sentence. This is that which makes the bone and sinew of men 
who keep God's way in defiance of every adversary. When there is something coming up against us that is trying to turn us away from doing the right thing, it is God's word that keeps us from that. As Adam told us earlier today, Psalm 119, verse 11, so I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And that kind of gets to the memorization. You can't store up God's word in your heart if you're not doing something to help you memorize it so that you can recall it when, it, when you need it. This is how Jesus handled things when he was tempted in the wilderness. He recalled scripture three different times. He recalled scripture out of the book of Deuteronomy. What would it look like when we are tempted and we're able to recall God's word in those situations? Job says, I have made a covenant with my eyes to not look upon a woman with lust. How would that affect us, men, when it comes to the temptation of pornography? If that verse came to our mind any time that we were tempted to look at something on a screen that we're not supposed to look at. To make a covenant with your eyes to not look upon a woman with lust. Or what about when somebody cuts you off while you're driving down the street? Or your neighbor offends you for some reason? Or somebody says something that could be taken as hurtful, but... Maybe they didn't intend it that way, and so, but we choose to be offended. But then the words of God come to mind that say that we should forgive as Christ forgave you. Kind of let God's word do it, and we need to feed and nourish on it, but But in addition to feeding on God's word, you have to take that one step further because, you know, we can get all the food that we want off of that smorgasbord of God's word here. But if we don't do what it says, it does us no good. You know, we are people under authority. And so we should be people who come under the authority of God's word. As Americans, we love to appeal to our rights under the Constitution. You know, I'm hearing that a lot when it comes to this new mask requirements. And yes, I'm going there. Um, I totally get it. And to some degree, I agree with those who'd say that this is, you know, whatever with our rights. But the Constitution is not a higher authority than God's word. If you tell me you won't wear a mask because it infringes on your rights or certain mandates that go against your rights, I'm not going to argue with you constitutionally. But I will ask you, how are you doing in sharing your faith? I will ask you, how are you doing in loving your neighbor? Because that is explicit in God's word. And if we're saying, I will obey the Constitution, but I'm not going to obey God's word, there's a disconnect here as for us as believers. At the same time, our culture is not a higher authority than God's word. You know what? It doesn't matter what our culture says about same-sex marriage. In 2004, 60% of our culture was against it. 2019, 61% was in favor of it. It doesn't matter where our culture is going with that. That's not what God's word says. It doesn't matter what the culture says, whether there are 63 or 112 genders. God's word is clear on those issues, not to mention biology, but you know. our culture is not a higher authority than God's word. 
Jesus replied in John 14, 23, all who love me will do what I say. It doesn't matter what Trump or Biden or anybody else, do what God says. Perhaps you've heard the equation, stated belief plus actual practice equals actual belief. And if that equation is true, what does your current obedience to God's word say about your degree to which you believe it? Your stated belief match your actual practice? Because your actual practice really is what you really believe. So let me just wrap up here. When we talk about God's word, we talk about it because this is how we know who God is and how we should live. And we urge you to hold it up with such esteem that you get into it and you allow it to speak to you, you allow it to change your life. I know our care groups aren't meeting this week, but I would encourage uh, to go back and study it. Read Matthew 7, 24 through 27. It talks about the wise man and the foolish man. Read Psalm 119. And it's the longest chapter in the Bible, but there's so much in it that just talks about the greatness of God's word. I urge us to be people of the book. And to hold it in such a way that it is transforming our hearts. That it would be the theme song of our life. And then when people look at you, when they look at me, they'll say, there is a man or a woman who lives and does what God says. And I would think that that would be the highest compliment that anybody could give to us. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Transform our hearts, God. And I even know that even as I'm saying that, how often I can minimize the place of your word in my life. I will feed off of the scraps rather than taking time to get into it and to study it. Lord, help us to be people who hold your word in such a way that it is changing us to be more like your son. We pray this in Jesus' name.